Hello and welcome to Coffee and Cocktails. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Wand. We have the pleasure today of listening to the host of the amazing podcast, The ex Kate J. Armstrong, who will be talking to us about Queen Elizabeth's time of the month, women's issues through the ages. But rather than ask what drink you were having for the show, Kate, would you like to begin? I would love to. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Anne said, my name is Kate, and I produce a podcast called The Explorers, where we time travel back through history to find out what life was like for women of the past. And if you've ever heard my show, you'll know that I really love to talk about periods. I love talking about um, periods through history and really anything having to do with the particularities of a female body through history. These are things that in the modern era, I really don't think that we talk about nearly enough. And certainly we don't talk about it enough when we talk about history. There's always been something of a veil of silence drawn over the whole issue. And even now in this age of the internet and oversharing on social media, people have all sorts of funny hangups about talking about women's physical issues. There are questions we're still too ashamed to ask and stories we're too embarrassed to share. In some ways, it's always been a loaded issue through history, but it's also a practical one that women have been dealing with since the beginning of time. And that's why I love exploring issues like these on my podcast when I'm talking about women of the past, because they're everyday issues. They're mundane issues. And how different cultures and eras have dealt with them can tell us a lot about what it was like to live as a woman or a woman who menstruates in a past era. And there are also issues that link us with the past in this really visceral way. People of the past often feel like a different species to us. But in talking about these everyday issues, you remember that they too had to figure out what to do when caught out in public without any you know, sanitary products to deal with their period. Or when they found themselves with particularly bad cramps. It really highlights how they dealt with the same issues that we do. And the cultural framework around that, how they dealt with that can tell us a lot and help us better understand their lives. And because the past is very much present, we can also learn a lot about the world we're living in today, and it can give us some really interesting context for that. So if you will indulge me, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of women's periods. Obviously, this is not a super comprehensive talk because we just don't have time to go down all the rabbit holes. Um, This is going to be kind of a, a skim through a survey, if you will, of some of uh, the history of periods and that issue and how women and different cultures related to the issue. So in pretty much every time period, we see cultural taboos around menstruation. And a lot of those revolve around the idea of it being unclean in some way, either physically or spiritually. But men have long been awed by a woman's time of the month And they often describe them as powerful and sometimes even dangerous. And this is especially true in the ancient world. In ancient Greece, Aristotle believed that if a woman with her period looked into a mirror, it would cloud over. Such was her force at that time. Her period not only affected her eyes, which of course are filled with blood vessels, so obviously, but actually had the power to disturb and distort the air around her like some kind of angry female cloud. Ancient Romans feared the power of a menstruating woman. Pliny the Elder, bless him, had some very interesting notions about a woman and her period. He believed that during a solar or lunar eclipse, she'd have the power to actually kill a man just by having sex with him while she was menstruating. This is an idea that we're going to see crop out throughout, crop up throughout the ages, that period blood has the power to actually hurt the male member. So watch out. Pliny also believed it would contaminate anything purple, which is interesting because that was a color that for most of ancient Rome's history, only an emperor could wear. But it could also be a good kind of power. If a menstruating woman stripped naked and walked through a field, she'd have the power to kill any pests any pests that happened upon her. Terrifying, but it was actually an effective means of pest control. 
Apparently, this was discovered uh, in Cappadocia during a particularly bad beetle infestation. A bunch of menstruating women took it upon themselves to go into the fields with their skirts hiked up to their butt cheeks, and apparently, it worked a treat. In ancient Egypt, menstrual blood was also considered a potent substance, and it was often used as a vital ingredient in medicine, added to drugs, ointments, and salves. One papyrus suggests that if a woman has droopy breasts, she should go ahead and smear menstrual blood all over herself uh, in order to perk them right up. And also, in much of the ancient world, to bleed in such a way was considered a really important act of cleansing for a woman. It was something that was healthy. This is another thing we'll see a lot of in past eras, the notion that menstrual blood is important for a woman's health and that it shouldn't be suppressed, which is something that we see change in more recent history. There are two things we see a lot of in the history of periods. One is that period blood has some powerful spiritual implications and that it should be regulated or it'll have dire consequences, not just for the woman, but for the community at large. So this is something that actually impacts the broader community and therefore can be very dangerous. The period has long been linked to the moon. Etymologically speaking, the word menstruation is related to the word moon and it's associated with goddesses of the moon in several religious systems. Some anthropological studies of indigenous myths in North and South America have found a prevailing idea that if a woman's cycle isn't monitored, and if it doesn't follow a certain rhythm, much like the moon, that chaos might actually ensue. In North America, the Cherokee Indians believed that menstrual blood gave women special powers and that it could actually allow her to destroy her enemies, which is pretty awesome, if you ask me. But we also see it related to dark sorcery. Mayan mythology explains that women menstruate as a punishment for violating certain social rules around marriage. Their blood turns into snakes and insects in some instances that can then be used in dark sorcery. In many cultures, though, menstruating women were supposed to be kept separate to stay away from others, particularly men, during their time of the month. This is nearly universal, the idea that periods make a woman unclean in some way, and thus she needs to be quarantined and isolated from the rest to keep everyone safe. It's often said to be a safety measure to protect people from what is said to be an evil stain. But there are others who have argued in certain cultures that it's also about protecting the rare spiritual power that a woman comes into when she menstruates. In some traditional societies, such menstrual rituals are experienced as protective and empowering, offering a female-only space away from the male gaze and maybe just a break from their rigorous domestic demands. For example, in some Pakistani traditions, there is a communal what's called a bashali or a large menstrual house, which is considered one of their most holy spaces, and it serves as an all-female organizing center. Some cultural evolutionary scholarship says that some cultures believed that menstrual blood actually makes the female body more holy, which is not an idea in the Western tradition that we hear a lot about. It's really interesting to me that in many cultures, especially in ancient cultures, women don't have to actually hide their periods. Instead, they just step out of the flow, so to speak, of their communities while they have it. And maybe that's not always a bad thing. But in many Western cultures beyond the ancient world, we see menstruation become a great and shameful secret, something to be tucked under skirts and never spoken of. Hence the rise in drugs that let you skip your period for many months at a time in the modern era. There's one study in particular that found in our era, some 59% of American women who were surveyed said they'd rather not menstruate every month. And of those, a third said they were interested in not menstruating at all. Is this because it's messy and women would just rather not deal with it? Maybe but there's undoubtedly some cultural shaming involved here. Women throughout time have dreaded their periods for all the reasons that you'd imagine. 
But many didn't have the option of running to the store for a box of tampons. So what did women of the past do uh, about their time of the month? We don't have a lot of evidence from ancient eras in regards to what kinds of period protection women used, partially because there's a veil drawn across a lot of these issues and a lot of women didn't feel the need to write about it, but also because especially in the ancient world, you know, textiles don't last um, and especially soiled everyday textiles were not going to make it down to us. But it seems that ancient Egyptian women and I'm sure women around them and who came before them seem to have worn some kind of loincloth situation. We know that because it's described in a papyrus scroll as a part of a list of unpleasant professions in which the writer points out how much it sucked to be a laundry man because in ancient Egypt, laundry tended to be a man's job, specifically because he had to handle women's under things, horrors. A majority of European medieval women probably had fewer periods than your average modern day woman because of nutrition. Um, it just wasn't as good as ours. And because many of them spent a lot of time pregnant. So again, they're not having regular periods. But what did they use when their monthly did come since underwear were not yet popular? Cotton rags, it seems, were the thing attached to something like an early form of panty. And they also wrapped cotton around things like sticks and used them as makeshift tampons. So if you think about it, our period products haven't actually changed that much in many hundreds of years. There was also a common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England. It was super absorbent. It was used for stuffing as stuffing for pads. It was used as uh, toilet paper and as battlefield dressing. Some think it got its most popular nickname, blood moss, because of its use on the battlefield. But there are others who think that it earned this name because of how it often helped medieval women out in their time of bodily need. In Christian dominant countries, we see the idea of menstruation as unclean, both physically and spiritually, start to come to the fore. Eve's curse is the punishment for God, a punishment from God for her temptation in the Garden of Eden. I'm not a biblical scholar, so this is kind of the, this is the impression that I get. <laughs> Women were not allowed to take painkillers, um, or so the church often said, because God meant for them to suffer. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, they did take painkillers, but that was the official line on the matter. In Tudor era England, some people believed a woman's menstrual blood was dangerous, even poisonous, if it came in contact with a male member. So again, we see that idea of menstrual blood being able to harm a man coming to the fore. <clears throat> so for instance, a child born from having sex while menstruating would give them red hair, terrible of course, um, and would possibly mean that they'd come out deformed. How they got this idea is a mystery. <laughs> Periods were considered necessary, though, because if a woman didn't bleed regularly, some believed she could drown in her own feminine essence. Doesn't sound like a pleasant way to go. If a woman struggled with irregular periods, she was prescribed things like hot baths, herbs inserted into the area in question, or herbs drunk as part of a tea. Catherine of Aragon, who was Henry VIII's first wife, famously suffered from irregular periods. What products they may have used is, as always, a hazy issue, but we think that they're once again dealing with rags, probably this time made of linen. The number one undergarment material of choice at this time was linen because it was hygienic, absorbent, and easy to wash. People in Queen Elizabeth's era changed their linen undergarments multiple times a day for their health. And we know that monarchs like Queen Elizabeth and her father um, had a special laundress to wash their unmentionables. So it wasn't just, they had a huge team of people who did their, their laundry, but there was someone who was paid extra to do their underwear um, because the queen was considered a, a conduit to God and thus to touch her under things, especially ones that may have contained her menstrual blood, was almost a sacred duty. For much of history, women didn't wear underwear the way we think of it today. So, you know, that would constitute a problem when you're talking about your time of the month. Like in the Victorian era, women wore drawers that were essentially a pair of loose 
shorts that had a big slit on the crotch seam to make it easy when they were wearing those big dresses to do their business without having to strip down. Um, it's hard to say what period protection they were using because it's the Victorian era and it's very buttoned up and they didn't write much about it. But advertisements of the era and the rise of mail order at this time shows us that there were plenty of companies that wanted to cash in by offering women some solutions, like the tampon. In an 1870s ad started that started to appear around this time in Britain was called Dr. Aveling's Vaginal Tampon Tube which had an applicator contraption involving a glass speculum and a wooden rod. So time travelers, have fun with that. The history of the tampon, like all of period history, is a bit murky to say the least. Women from the ancient period onward have been said to make their own, because of course they did, out of wool, paper, vegetable fibers, rolls of grass, essentially whatever they had on hand. But it wasn't until a company developed a cellulose substance for bandages during World War I that we had what later turned into Kotex pads, which started selling commercially around 1921. 1936 saw the first tampons make their way onto the market, at least in America. And there's this wonderful myth about the guy who almost invented the tampon. He was a Kimberly Clark employee named John Williamson, and apparently he poked some holes in a condom, then he stuffed it full of the materials used to make commercial pads, and he went to his dad, who was a Kimberly Clark medical consultant, to pitch this idea to him as an insert for a woman's time of the month. His dad, horrified, told his son the following, never would I put any such strange article inside a woman, which is hilarious because it was based on a condom, which was probably regularly inside a woman. But anyway, okay, dad. And so the idea got knocked back. What I love particularly and find interesting is that we would think that it was a man who was ever going to invent the tampon, invent the tampon, uh, when really it had probably been around for a long time. And what men did, as per, maybe per usual, is that they found a way to monetize it and make money from it. So what about women with menstrual symptoms that they wanted some help with? Where could they turn? Apparently women of many eras were were apparently women of many eras were loath to go to their mostly male doctors for help. And really it's no wonder. Their responses were often to say that such pains were actually the woman's fault. In Victorian America, around the 1850s, one doctor attributed period complaints to, and this is a quote, prurient incitement of passions during pictures, statues, music, novels, and theaters. So basically she was having too much fun. Another blamed a premature menstrual flow on a woman's having gone to the city and eaten too rich foods. So again, she had too much fun. And there are those who believe that a woman having too heavy a flow was a sign that she was having too much sex, which was bad, even if she was only having sex with her husband. Bad news. So beyond the moral judgment was the notion that underpinned a lot of Western medicine, that periods and wombs and things like that made women physically inferior or less than men and was responsible for their many failings. We see these interesting connections through history between a woman's cycle, um, sort of morality, moral judgment, fertility, and insanity. There's this really strange and murky connections going on there. Um, we see this a lot in the 19th century in the Victorian era, which is the era when hysteria really came to the fore. So hysteria, a word that Merriam-Webster defines as a psychoneurosis marked by emotional excitability and disturbances and behavior exhibiting overwhelming or unmanageable fear or emotional excess actually has its roots in an ancient Greek word for womb. This is a female-only illness, and it goes back all the way to ancient times, when Greek and Egyptian doctors believed that wounds weren't fixed in one place, but they would wander throughout the body, causing all sorts of problems. Um, a lady who had a wandering womb would exhibit symptoms uh, that essentially made her unpredictable and unreasonable. 
um, an idea about women and their periods that has stuck with us <laughs> stubbornly into the modern day. So she was more prone to emotional outbursts and basically the inability to control her emotions and her actions. So of course, women didn't want to seek out help for issues relating to their periods and often still don't. Why would you risk it? Why would you risk the doctor saying that you were weak, incompetent, or insane? You could argue that men's attitudes about periods have always and continue to influence how women feel about their bodies and the many things that they do. And overwhelmingly, that attitude is that periods are gross and should be hidden. And also that a woman's cycle makes her unreasonable and emotional. I find this highly problematic. <laughs> so the media doesn't always help when it comes to these attitudes. In so much of history, when we look into the issue of periods, a curtain of uncomfortable silence descends. We often see it in the media playing out in ads about the issue in movies in plays. And this has changed a lot in recent years with much more frank talk about periods and that whole thing becoming less taboo. But there's still a tendency to avoid the word period. I read somewhere that the word wasn't actually used on American television until 1985. And I don't know about you, but I grew up getting the message that pretty much I grew up getting the message from pretty much all sides that periods were gross and something that you should be ashamed of. I remember viscerally in middle school and high school vowing that I would never buy white pants, mostly because I lived in absolute terror of bleeding through them and being brutally mocked, which I saw a few girls um, suffer from as if it was something that they should be embarrassed about. For most of history, menstruation has been treated as something that should be hidden and something that's intensely and purposefully private. But these things impact women and they impact how they move in the world and they impact society more generally. You've probably heard the term period poverty. It's the idea that some women don't have the luxury of being able to afford a constant stream of sanitary products. Pads and tampons can get expensive and that's especially true because so many of them are one-time use, so you have to keep buying them. And even the more sustainable alternatives like period underwear and reusable cups require you to shell up, shell out a decent amount of money up front and someone living paycheck to paycheck may not be able to afford that. There are many situations where such supplies are hard to find. There are a lot of public spaces and private spaces where it's difficult to find what you might find that you need. And a lot of people feel too embarrassed to ask and inquire. And as they always have, these things affect a person's freedom to work, to study, and it impacts how they engage with the world. So that's why I love studying and talking about periods when I talk about women in history. It reminds us that we aren't so different from the women who came before us. They struggled with the same issues and expectations that we do. And looking at how they dealt with these things gives us such an interesting glimpse into their lives and into the past. By talking about these things on my show, uh, it's my way of expressing that these issues aren't trivial. Um, and they're especially not triv trivial when we're looking back at history. They're valuable. They're valuable in helping us understand the past and getting a window into it. It's my way of bringing this everyday issue out of the shadows and more into the public discourse and normalizing it, normalizing this thing that so many women deal with. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'll give you a, give you a clap. Big old virtual clap. That was really good. I like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> Whoo! Presentation's good. over. Yeah. And now I'm going to bring in all the judges and they're going to ask you questions. What did you mean by this? You said this. You said well, it's not every like day that I times. <laughs> going to period jail. <laughs> yeah, going to period jail. Uh, there's just, it's over. It's like a topic where there's just so much you could say, so much to say. But it's also a thing I don't get the opportunity to talk about at such length. So. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, a, so there's a lot of stuff that came up and, um, yeah, I, I I took a lot of notes. Um, I always tell you know whenever anybody comes to do a presentation, I always take notes, not because I'm secretly judging them. I mean, if I am, I'm not secrets. So I can't tell you, but um, but I would say that I always take notes because I always have ideas that are running through my head while you're talking, and that's and that's really good, right? So 
Uh, one of the things that came up, and I'm basing this off um, some lectures I'd done in the past. So you talked about how um, if you had sex during your period, in this during the medieval era, your um, kid would have red hair. And I wasn't yeah. sure if you came across this in your notes, but having red hair was associated with the devil. Exactly. So, yeah. So uh, if you look at El the Elizabethan era, whenever a devil was portrayed on stage, the devil always had a big nose, which was associated with Judaism. So there's a, there's a link as well between the period, Judaism, the devil, and the look. And so you would have a big nose because the Jew, apparently, and I say the Jew, I use quotes, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but this is based on the literature, uh, was associated with the devil. And then if you had red hair, you also were linked to Satan and um, you also had a fiery temper. So there was this whole sort of idea that you would have a problematic child. And there was also this idea with, and I, I again, I'm not sure if you came across this in your work with the menstrual cycle that um, for so about 350 years, so I'm going to go into a bit of a history lesson here, but for about 350 years, um, the Jewish community wasn't allowed into England until the time of um, Oliver Cromwell, because they realized that the Jews, according to their belief system, they thought that the Jewish community had more money. So we're going to allow them back into England. So for 350 years, Jews were not allowed on um, British soil. Wow. So this idea was, and there were rumors that spread about, you know, how terrible the Jewish community was. And one of the things that came up was the menstrual cycle. And there was this idea that, um, again, I'm, I'm, people who hadn't ever, they never knew a Jewish person for 350 years. They didn't, they did, wouldn't even know one if they saw one on the street. So they had this assumption that Jewish people, one of the terrible things that they did is they stole women's menstrual blood. And the idea was that the men, the Jewish men weren't really men and that they would actually steal women's menstrual cycle. So it was part of this like weird sort of myth that the men weren't actually, Jewish men weren't real men. They would steal women's menstrual cycles as well as steal babies and this, that, and the other. And it, there's this weird sort of connection that like bridges Christianity with the other and... And then somehow our menstrual cycle got thrown into this. And it's it's so bizarre. It's so incredibly outlandish. And yet, I, I don't know. I don't know if it just comes as a result of not having television. But, you know, there's, is, there's interesting that there are these peculiar links. And I was just wondering in terms of your research, you know, did you ever just sit there and go, what? <laughs> like, wow, what? Yes, I, of course. But I also feel like there are things when you dive into the research that come up again and again and again. And one of them is this idea, this link between, um, you know, a woman's menstrual cycle being powerful and ritualistically powerful, but also potent in ways that are dangerous. So it can, it can taint, it can, uh, it can, you know, it's, it's associated with the devil. It's associated with, um, the darker sort of elements, which is so interesting to me. That is, it's this thing that's very private and intimate, but it's also linked with things that go beyond a single woman. Like it has the power to heal, but it also has the power to hurt. And I, yes. I do like, it did just blow my mind to think that this thing that is so in, in many ways mundane, like it's a thing that many people throughout history have experienced regularly. It's like a, a physical thing becomes so much bigger and it takes on so many different connotations beyond. Well, you know, I have my time of the month, so I better find something to, you know, deal deal with that with. It's like, it's, it's interesting, all of the different kind of um, hats that get hung on that one peg. Yes. I mean, the other thing I kept thinking about, and again, I'm basing this off uh, something I taught a while ago. Um, when I know I talked about this with you is I, I taught a course on neo-paganism. And one of the things that came out as a result of the summer of love of 1968 was this rise of feminism. And within that, there was a branch of feminism that resulted in what I guess we'd refer to now as neo-paganism. And mm -hmm. this idea of um, the woman being powerful. And I think the menstrual cycle plays into that. And they, they always talk about life being sort of secular, like the moon. So you've got, um, you know, you're a small child and then you're a woman and then you're a crone. And 
within that, there's like a sort of like a power force that comes with that. You know, your innocence and then you're at your most your strongest and then you're kind of fading out into into death, I guess. But the cycle also, there was a lot of reappropriation, I think, that gets placed into that. And I think it's interesting how, regardless as to people's, you know, religious beliefs, whether they agree with it or not, um, people took that and they thought, I don't want to be ashamed of this anymore. And I want to take the name of the crone or the name of the woman and I want to embody that and with pride. And I think it's interesting that it sort of manifests itself into a, a new realm of religion that um, was also, and even now is seen as as a bit odd or, you know, what have you. And people have gone, you can call it odd all you want, but I want to own this and I want to be proud of it. And I think that that's interesting too. And I wasn't sure if you came across anything in in researching this um, to those lines. Yeah, I mean, I... I found it really interesting that kind of the often the further back you go and you don't even have to go very far if you're talking like outside Western tradition that you see this idea of the menstrual period making a woman more powerful or that time of the month is integral to something inside her that that creates and sort of gives her ritual importance. But it also... There's, there's this idea that in, in several cultures around the world at different times that like during a woman, when a woman was menstruating, that there would be like a separate place that she would go and isolate. And when I first heard that years ago, I thought, oh, well, that sucks. Like the idea that a woman had to kind of go to the side and hide herself away. Like that was the point. It's like, ooh, this is shameful and you've got to hide yourself away. But then you start really looking into that and reading about that. And, and there are a lot of people who say, actually, it was a lot more complicated than that. And it wasn't necessarily about shoving her to the side and saying, you need to be hidden. It was about saying, this is a, this is your very potent at this time. Like spiritually, there's something about this time that is potent and you need to be separated so that you're not tainted by the rest of us. It was like, (laughs) kind of like that separation was about the woman's power as much as it might've been about protecting the rest of the community and how perhaps that wasn't so much about shutting her away, but giving her like a separate space and how that's not always a bad thing. It's just very interesting to me, sort of, and especially when we're looking back on history, I think it's easy to always, it's easy to take our conceptions and and place them on past era. So it's easy to look at that and see one thing, but it's like, well, it was more complicated than that. So I think there's often a fine line between, you know, I don't know, kind of shoving a woman to the side because of that thing or saying, this is a special thing about you and we want to make, I don't know, it's like ritualistically, we want to make space for that. Yeah. Um, and I do think that especially more more recently, you're right, there's been a lot of reclaiming of the language around menstruation um, about making it more visible about taking it from something that's private and embarrassing and gross and all the things that have been attached to it and turning it into something empowering. And I think there's still a lot of work to do there, especially you know, a lot of the portrayals in the media we see have to do with drama and emotion and exaggeration. And I don't know about you, but I still hear people say, and I hear women say this too. I've probably said it as a joke at some point about like, well, I'm just really feeling emotional. It's my time of the month or, you know, someone joking about how that somehow, you know, is going to drastically change your behavior. And look, you know, sometimes it does a little bit, but I also- <laughs> sometimes you're just, they're just being a jerk, you know, it's like, right. maybe, maybe you guys need like- an attitude adjustment. And yeah. I do feel like we are starting to to own what people in past eras were sometimes better at, which was saying, you know, we're not static beings and every day is not the same. You know, our hormonal balances change and, and especially for women, you know, during our time of the months and when we're ovulating, these things do impact how we feel, our energy levels, all that stuff. So like on one hand, I feel like we're starting to do a better job of going, yeah, that's a real thing. And we should 
honor that. But there's also still those jokes about, whoa, it must be your time of the month. (laughs) (laughs) I really wish we'd move on. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's not. Maybe I hate you. Like they maybe that we should just (laughs) maybe have a t-shirt that's no, it's just your face. And just (laughs) yes. There's so like when you start to look at that, you know, inane comments like that and you and you go backwards through time, you think about, wow, like women have been dealing with that for millennia, but also like the history of of that attitude is so deep and so long. And I think that looking back at the different attitudes we've taken about it is really instructive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to kind of tap into a couple points as well. So um, you were talking about how women, you know, that we were talking about this idea of empowerment, right? And there was a, a book that came up that while you were talking. I don't know if you ever heard of The Red Tent by Anita Diamonds. It is an amazing yeah. book. And um, I, I read it probably 20 years ago. Maybe a little less than that. I'm not that old. But anyway, point is I read it a while ago. And uh, what I loved about it is it was based on a biblical storytelling. But, obviously, you know, it's a fiction book. And what she talks about, the red tent is the place where women would go, especially nomadic communities. That was where they went during their time of the month. And that was their space for women to be, have their quiet time or what have you. And they would spend their time in that tent during that period. And then they would go back to their spouses and their families or whatever. And one of the things that struck me is that at least in the writing of that book, it was just almost kind of like, you know, men have their shed and women have their tents, but it was like, that was their space. And it, the way she crafted it, it didn't seem derogatory. It was more just like women are allowed to have time to themselves. So right. it wasn't just the place for, for them to menstruate, but it was also a place for them to have girl time and to get away from regular duties and just have a little vacay so to speak, with your girlfriends. And I thought that was really interesting. But the other side of it is there was a a documentary that came out some time ago recently about the Jewish Orthodox community. And in some more conservative Orthodox communities during the women's menstruation period, the man has to take over the women's chores. So um, in a way, the way they the wife was talking about it is like, okay, I can't be hugged or touched by my kids, but the man's going to have to step up and do my stuff for me. So in a way, it kind of gives me a break because for this certain time of the month, I get to sort of like step back a little bit. And I thought it was a really interesting spin. And from the man's perspective, it was like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to have to do the cooking and the cleaning and this, that, and the other because she's not allowed to touch anything because this is her time. And so I thought it was a really fascinating way of reinterpreting it instead of saying I'm not allowed to touch my own kids she's like actually it's kind of nice to have a little break (laughs) so um, and the man feeling very comfortable taking on the so to speak women's roles because it's like well of course I'm the man of course I'm going to take over while she has her time that's my job and I thought oh that's that's so interesting and I wasn't sure if you had any thoughts on that well and you know we look at these things and it's it's easy on the face of it to go oh well you know patriarchy and you know the woman is tainted and you know she can't that's that's so messed up but i think it's it's always more complicated than that and i do think when you look at something like the red tent when you look at the idea of of a woman being distanced or isolated during that time it's not it's not an it's not simple and it's also not always negative right like like you say I think there's something really powerful, especially when you when you're going way back, like you're and you're going way back to biblical times when women lived pretty grueling lives. Most women, not all women, but most women, and are doing a lot of domestic labor, and they're they're doing a lot with the kids. And like, imagine being able to go to that tent and spend quality time with other women, and to perhaps like confide in other women and have quiet time and have the time to collect your thoughts and maybe just rest. Like that might have been a time that people really looked forward to. And it is an opportunity perhaps for a woman to reflect, to reset, to um yeah, have some time to herself when, you know, they didn't often get time to themselves. And one of their, you know, main virtues was giving. Um, you know, emotionally giving to their family and raising raising the kids and making sure that they're moral human beings. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of 
even in the way we talk about periods and the way different cultures deal with periods and talk about periods, there's a lot of moral judgment. And I think that that's often misplaced, or at least it's like more nuanced and more, more um, complex than we think. Like having gendered spaces isn't always bad. You know? No, definitely not. Not even a little bit. Um, I was going to say just a couple more items just because, you know, this is fun. Um, why not? <laughs> why not? It's uh, still the morning for me, though I'm sure you're ready to hit the hay. Um, how do you go about looking this stuff up? Do you just go to Google and say <laughs> periods and then just like see what happens? How do you do this? Often, which is really fun when you're when you're is it? Uh, <laughs> they could hit I mean, enter and be like, oh, <laughs> I'm mostly like really fun rabbit holes, and you have to decide which ones to go down. But you know, it depends what I've been researching recently. Um, you know, I'd already done a decent amount of research about. Um, Victorian era, and I've spent my season two in the ancient world learning a little bit. And fun fact, which is not about periods, but is about women's issues. So did you know that ancient in ancient Egypt, they developed what we think was one of the earliest pregnancy tests? <gasps> oh, is this where they pee? And then they pee yes. on some reeds? Like M or wheat. And if it, you know, if it um, blooms, if it starts to sprout, within a week or something, then it means you're pregnant, which is accurate. It, it works. <laughs> anyway. you, know, you know, it's funny you say that, not to cut you off, but I read recently um, that there was some Indian like beauty site was saying that if you mix your urine, I want to say with vinegar and it bubbles, then that means that oh. you're pregnant i was like well wouldn't it bubble when you mix it in anyway because i'm okay fine i'll just i'll just shut up i think it was that and like baking soda and if it bubbles and it means you're pregnant i don't know you gotta look it up look it up but one one thing i will say that i didn't bring up during the talk but i it, i found in the course of my research is that you know a lot of these kind of um how to deal with your periods you know concepts conception um anything having to do with like women's bodies and sexuality often these things aren't written down because women turn to each other and talk to mm -hmm. each other about like what do i do about this and it was often passed from you know mother or auntie to daughter and in fact in america they've done some studies in the last couple of years because you know there's they're always doing surveys and things about sex ed in public schools and the vast majority like 70, 75% of girls, teen girls said they would rather learn about periods and sex from their mothers than from yeah. public school. It complete, I mean, on several fronts makes complete sense to me. But mm. yeah, I mean, the research for something like this, I love doing these broader surveys because on one hand, I know there's just so much out there and so much to think about. And I just you know, it, it would take me 18 hours to do anything like comprehensive dive into, you know, periods through history because it's so big. But that's the the joy and the fun of research is you start, I start reading a couple of academic articles about, you know, ancient Greece and um, ideas about menstruation and it leads me to something else and it leads me to some New York Times article from, you know, 40 years ago. And I find things that I didn't expect to find. And I just basically follow the trail of what I've find interesting or if I find some central thread that seems to keep repeating itself, I chase that. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's sort of a fluid process often. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I guess what I would be curious to know is how far do you see yourself pushing the envelope in terms <laughs> of the stuff you want to discuss going forward? Uh, I think I'm going to push it pretty hard. I think I'll push it harder than I've pushed it so far. I, I, as I said, I do feel like we are getting better at talking more openly about these issues, but I do think we still have a lot of hangups about it. And I think that that's a huge problem, especially for women who menstruate or, you know, when we're talking about conception, when we're talking about um, things like miscarriage uh, and infertility yeah. and, yeah. you know, you know, women, things like, you know, huge, I forget the percentage um, of women, but like a huge percentage of women, especially women who have had children, like pee their pants a little bit. Sometimes. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand there. Uh, I have an embarrassing story, mom. I'm really sorry, but it's coming out now. So... <laughs> 
So my sister and I are evil. We're just evil, naturally innate. And um, when we You're were not teen- even, you don't even have red hair, so I don't even have red hair. But it's it maybe I'll, maybe it's dyed. Maybe it's dyed. Anyway, so I remember we were on a trip, and we knew mom kept mom kept having little accidents, and we were like, "This is hilarious." So <laughs> we went on. She was walking. We were on a trip. She was walking down the hallway, and I said to my sister, "I said, hey, hey, hide behind here," and my mom's walking, doing her thing. And we went, no. boo! And she went, oh, you guys! And then she's like, open the door, open the door, open the door. But the damage was done. And we thought it was the funniest thing ever. Fast forward, I have a kid. Every time I so much as think about sneezing, it's like, oh, oh man. And I'm like, this is what happens. This is karma. This is karma. And now I know. And that, yeah. So it's, it's now biting me in the bottom, shall we say. Yep. And I just feel like one of the biggest shocks for me in becoming an adult woman is realizing how little prepared I was for so much of what it means to be an adult woman in the world, sort of physically and otherwise, you know? I think that there's just such a cone of silence about so much of this stuff. And it's not until especially women start talking about it and normalize talking about it that you look at each other and go, oh... So you do that too? That happens to you too? Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was just me. And I've you been- You pee your pants? Mm-hmm, yeah. Right? And I'm just continually shocked. Like, <laughs> and I don't wear diapers, so. <laughs> like, you know, the things that- <laughs> And the things that happen during childbirth that we don't talk about. It's like, it's just all the things that have to yeah. do with women's body. We just don't talk about. And I find it- I, I find it problematic on a lot of levels. Well, and you know, it's interesting. And I'm going to say it because we're talking about periods and like I mean, whatever. But period. when I was... So again, people don't talk about this. We use a lot of um, descriptors. So we say time of the month. We say ant flow. We don't just yeah. say you're okay. bleeding and you need to sort yourself out. Like we don't say that. So when I was pregnant, I was like, woohoo! I'm not going to have my period for nine months. Like big highlight. What they didn't tell me is that the blood doesn't disappear. Like it's still there. So when you have a kid, that nine months no. is all got to go somewhere. And it so takes... Your body just like stores it? It stores oh, it. What? Your body what? is a barrel of nine months of period. So oh, it boy. stores it. They don't tell you this. They don't tell no. you this. Where is this in the mail? I no, should have known. Don't. So now everybody who's listening, this is the <gasps> facts. And it doesn't matter. People go, oh, well, if I don't, if I don't get birth vaginally, I'm like, no, it still has to go somewhere, whether you have a C-section or not. Like, it's not like the blood goes, just kidding. I'm going to disappear now. So whether you have a C-section or a vaginal birth, like, it's got to go. And so when you give birth, after you've done the thing, they give you the world's biggest sanitary pads that look like you could use them as pillows. And yeah. you wear those for four weeks because it's got to absorb nine months of period in four weeks. Wow. See? And Mind just think blown. about that. Like you've just, there was just a child inside your body and now it's outside your body. However, it got there and like all the things about being a new parent plus and I think that's the thing when you're talking about women now and women in history is you think about, you know, they were doing this, they were doing that, but they were also dealing with that. Like, and nobody <laughs> didn't know. I didn't know. Somebody warned me and they're like, FYI, nine months period just about to happen. And I was like, nine months of what? Yeah. 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 And then you're like, I don't have, there's no tampon on God's green earth that's going to help me out. So, uh, yeah. 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 And uh, you know, like back in the day when they didn't they didn't have the same things that we did, like what did they do? That becomes a fascinating question when you think about like this isn't a small issue. It's a really fascinating issue. And I do one of the things I learned about ancient Greece, specifically ancient Sparta, and we know this from looking at gravestones and you know inscriptions, is that women were often given the same kinds of sort of funereal descriptions as warriors, like the language and the way they talk about women who had given birth and war, male warriors was very much the same because they 
put them on the same level. It's like, yes, you are a warrior <laughs> because you, yes. had, you had Spartan babies. You fought yes. in a war, you had Spartan babies. You're kind of on an equal playing field, and yes. I, which I think is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> and we well, should do more. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I when I gave birth, right, so my husband was like all excited, baby's here. He made sure to take pictures of me next to my placenta, which was near my head, which I didn't know, which is great. Now it's on Facebook. Yeah. Awesome. Um, but... <laughs> He did say that I looked like victorious. That was, I think the words like roughly what he's like, you looked victorious. It's like, I did this thing. And it was like, well, yeah, did you see? Didn't you see it? <laughs> Didn't you just see what I, I mean, it was like, the body's amazing. And then the fact that it can then heal itself back to, yeah. back to where it was before. Cause like, if we're going to talk about taboos, like, Hmm. Let's just say vag. If you're gonna your your lady bits, um, yeah. your vagina. Uh, lady. I was I nervous, like. and again, I really hope my dad doesn't listen to this episode because I might I might crawl under a hole and die. I, but I anyway, think he would have I think he would have pressed pause a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just won't tell him it came out. Sorry, didn't come out. Okay. It was it was a mess. It was a total mess. <laughs> blood everywhere um but yeah when the vagina i was terrified i was going to be the size of the albert hall i was like that's it it's going to be an echo chamber be like that forever and i had nobody to ask i couldn't be like so is your vagina an echo chamber now that you've had three kids like you can't ask somebody that and that so you just gotta hope and then it, it turned out like it's fine back to normal like thumbs up no issues like nothing happened that's it's crazy. Just, yeah, it's just wild. And, you know, in reading about the Victorian era, I remember reading like, because a lot of women, and this this would have been true in many periods, but a lot of women were having several babies. And so, and just were sort of dealing with a, a certain reality when it came to medical assistance. So a lot of them had prolapsed uteruses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, like, oh, yes, that's sort of an interesting and horrifying factoid, but it's not just a factoid. When you think about what that woman was having to deal with on a daily, you know, on the daily, like how did she deal mm -hmm. with that and how did that impact how she moved through the world? It's a, it's a big issue and it, it's, it's fascinating and it's worth diving into because it's like, this is the stuff of every day, which yeah. is the stuff of history, you know? Yeah. And what was it, um, what was I listening to recently? And I'm getting, I'm probably with you. I don't know. Um, about uh yes it was queen it was um elizabeth queen elizabeth's sister mary mm -hmm. and there were a lot of taboos around her, surrounding her bloody mary for example is something that um people talk and if you look at bailey sarians and a whole thing on um on this which was fascinating but one of the things that came up was this idea of uh her sister not having her period and there was this assumption that she was pregnant, except nobody liked her. And so they never believed anything that she said. And uh, long story short, uh, the time to supposedly have her baby came and went. And then it turned out she wasn't actually pregnant, even though she had all the symptoms of a pregnancy. So that, again, there's all these fascinating, and again, it's, it's rabbit holes after rabbit holes. But I think that I think you could have a lot of fun with this if you decide you want to keep going. I think is what I'm trying to get at. I think it could be really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and there, and I definitely want to. I think that there are. It's an interesting way to come at history if you want to better understand what life was like, especially for you know women of the past to to look into these things because there's so many. It's like you can talk about politics, you can talk about culture and society you can talk about media you can just talk about the personal and domestic you can talk about i don't know if i said religious already probably <laughs> there are just so many ways that you can go and so many things to explore and i think that issues like this for me are such an interesting avenue into seeing history with fresh eyes so i i feel very i mean i'm an oversharer by nature that's Love good mm -hmm. um i feel like this is just stuff that I feel very strongly that we don't talk about enough and I would like to see normalized in whatever way I can contribute to that. I yeah. want to contribute. So I will definitely be talking about it more. I mean, you could even do a survey being like, so what sort of taboo stuff, maybe not bestiality, maybe, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you really want to, I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could find. I mean, it'd be it'd be interesting to see. Like, I mean, I think people might even be afraid to say it. Do you know what I mean? Like, they might be like, "Could you talk about that?" I don't know. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, I have to say that's it from us at Coffee and Cocktails with your host, Dr. Ann Wand. I'd like to thank Kate again for her wonderful talk this afternoon. If you enjoyed listening to Kate, feel free to subscribe to our channel, leave a comment or tell a friend about our show. It's support from our viewers and listeners that really helps us to keep the show going. Otherwise, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and have a great week. 